Great to meet again today to discuss what you are showing us in the now concerning your grace. Have your way by your spirit. Communicate to us as unto your sons in the earth rim. And we give you praise and glory because it's by your spirit that the word comes forth. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, welcome you to today's edition of the Authentic Kingdom Culture Live broadcast. And here we are in the conversation about grace. And yesterday, we released scriptural surveys, lesson uh, um, uh, three, four, five, three lessons bunched together. And for those who are in the classroom, you're going to read the three presentations together. They, they, we just had to cut them because the Facebook system cannot allow you to put more than 200 links in a lesson. And so we put them in three lessons for ease. What we are doing in the in the last revision of these uh, books and ebooks is to make them more readable. So instead of a lesson being too long, it's something you can just browse through in 25, 30 minutes. So if you are on a bus ride, if you are on an air ride, you are anywhere, you can easily read the lessons if you are reading or if you are watching on YouTube, you can watch two lessons in about 52 minutes or something like that. And the whole idea is to really make everything more gracefully possible for people to participate wherever they may be. And now it's time to do something very, very important. And one of it is has to do with getting to understand grace in context. Lesson six today is grace in the context so that we can begin to have the experiential reality of grace in our lives so that we can be fit for purpose, co-laborers with our Father in the vineyard. And so the question rightly comes, on what basis did grace operate in the Old Covenant? If you look at what we presented in the lessons that were released as lesson uh, uh, three, four, five, three focused on the word grace where we place in the Old Covenant. And if you look at it very well, all the things we put in the Old Covenant, there were two critical things about grace that you can design there from. One of them is grace is finding favor with Elohim or fellow people. And that context is from Genesis 6, 8 to Esther chapter 2, 7. There are 27 references to grace in the Bible down the Bible Gateway download we uh, published in that lesson. And one central thread running through all of them is grace is about finding favor with Elohim or with fellow human beings who have something we need. And Genesis 6, 8 lays the foundation of how the remnant is able to live an opposite lifestyle with the contemporary world. That even today, you know what? The whole world was full of wickedness, evil. But Noah and his family, because of him, his family, found grace in the sight of Elohim. So let nobody tell us that you cannot, you know, live differently from your environment. Whether it's on the campus, whether it's in the city, wherever it is, in the neighborhood, you don't need to be swept away by what sweeps away others. You know, others live worldly culture. We are called to live kingdom culture. Authentic kingdom culture is the kingdom culture expressing the constitution of the kingdom, which is the holy word of the Father. Men and brethren, the second thing we see about grace in the old covenant where we read is that it is gift freely given by Elohim to people without regard to whether they deserve it or not. Where of his own providence, by his own, with no external stimuli, no external thing pressing on him, where Elohim decides to give a gift to somebody or a calling to somebody. And this is so something important. It's articulated from Psalm 45, verse 2, to Zechariah 12, verse 10. That's what you see there, but mainly about grace as gift that is given. So what is the summary of these two concepts in the Old Covenant? The two concepts that summary is this. Grace is unmerited favor from Elohim. Unmerited in the sense that you didn't earn it. It's something that you didn't deserve it. It's something that he, on his own sovereign will, decides to make available to you or to me or to anyone for that matter. So unmerited favor, therefore, brings us to a reality of 
the, another definition of grace that we can say that grace refers to the divine act of releasing to humanity acceptance, strength, and capacity to accomplish tasks that are normally outside our range of ability. What ordinarily I cannot do because of my own peculiar makeup as a person, what I may not be able to accomplish alone when the Father releases and infuses some of his own divine ability to me, then it is said that I'm functioning in grace. In grace, there's grace for missionary work. There's grace to teach. There's grace to teach in the pulpit. There's grace to teach online. It requires different measures of grace. Grace for different things. So, again, let me put it out. The divine act of releasing to humanity acceptance, strength, and capacity to accomplish tasks that are normally outside our range of ability. And this is a very functional definition of grace. I come to think of it, as we mentioned yesterday, Adam and Eve were really products of grace. And they lived by grace until the day they frustrated grace by sinning against Elohim intentionally. Men and brethren, if you read Genesis 2 and 3, you discover what we've said. And therefore, men and brethren, we also need to know the reality again that speaking about grace we know we need to accept the reality that the fullness of grace is in and through Yeshua Hamashiach. So having reviewed the old covenant, it can be safely accepted that grace predated the law because grace is one of the attributes of Elohim. He is after all. As we are told in the book of 1 Peter 5.10, by the Elohim of all grace, all grace, proceeds from him. All grace is by him who has called us unto his eternal glory by Yeshua. After that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And I will say somebody, these four, these four things are yours to really appropriate, even in the now. I don't know what you have done. I don't know how many people here have suffered something for any length of time. You say for a while. The while could be a day. It could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a year. What have you suffered? Brother, my sister, my brother, can you receive it that the Elohim of all graces, after you have suffered a while, can you receive it that all the suffering and challenges, they were up to today, they were up till now. And as the Father says, to that which you have gone through, four things will happen to you. One, he will establish you. He will establish you. You'll be so stable that nothing can shake you again. Number two, he will, he will he, no, sorry, number one, he will perfect you. He's going to perfect you through what you have suffered. It was said of Yeshua, though he was son, he led to obedience by the things he suffered. The things you've been through, they are for your perfection. They are to take away dross, things you don't need out of you. They to make you rely on him alone. Number two, they are to establish you, make you solid, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. Number three, they are to strengthen you. And number four, they are to settle you. There's a divine settlement for you. Your suffering is not the end of the road. It's but part of the process. And the process ultimately is about you being settled, you being established, you being uh, 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 perfected. Men and brethren, if we also need to understand something, that the God of all grace, the Elohim of all grace, where he sits is called the throne of glory. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the Lord is saying, when you're going through the waters, he has already said it will not overflow you. You're going through the fire, it will not burn you. But the problem is that when people are going through, they allow what they are going through to so much latch into their mindset, into their psyche, that all they think about is that issue. Morning, afternoon, night. It gives them sleepless nights. What has happened? They've elevated what they are going through to an idol that consumes them, literally speaking. The Father is saying, Learn to look away from what you are going through and look up to he who is seated on the throne of grace. The Elohim of all grace is willing 
His hands are stretched out to release grace. That when you are looking at the challenge, you'll be seen. Remember Peter, the day Yeshua said, come to me. He was walking on water. The moment he began to look at the roaring of the water, to the right, to the left, he began to sink. And the father said, stop looking at that challenge. That challenge should challenge you to look up so that you can go forward. Today, I pray you receive the grace to look up to the Elohim of all grace, seated on the throne of grace. He said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because we come by the way of the blood, not on our own merit. So let us also reiterate the reality that if you back up a little bit, everything about Adam and Eve was by grace. And the awesome assignment or capacity Elohim gave Adam to be able to you know, be kind of co-creator by naming the things Elohim created, it was only by grace. Look at Genesis 2, 19. And out of the ground, the Lord Elohim formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was no final help need for him. All that Elohim created, he brought to Adam. And Adam named them. Where was he coming from? The grace of Elohim that gave him wisdom beyond him. Men and brethren, he bestowed it upon them. I, what of Abraham? Abraham was called by grace. There was a man living in all of the Chaldeans, the land of magicians, the land of occultism up till this present era, that area or something else. In those days, it was something else. In the midst of that idolatry and adulterous generation, Elohim singled out a man, Abraham. And say, Abraham say, come out of your father's house. Genesis chapter 12. And gave him promises, verse 1 to verse 3. Awesome promises. Come out of thy own house. Come out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house. He told him, unto a land I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I'll bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. The Father is saying that to somebody right now. That the Father says he will make your name great. It's not, it's not about you, it's about him for his purpose. Are you willing to lay down your life and not seek your own glory? Are you willing to go where he tells you to go, not minding any inconvenience to you? The Father says he will make your name great. And he says you shall be a blessing. He's not talking about you struggling for the crumbs. He says you'll be a blessing. Blessing will be stored up in you and you pull them out when needed. He said, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham, Abraham found grace, and that grace he found kept him. Even when Abraham stumbled in the manner of Sarah, his wife, who he claimed to be his sister in that same Genesis chapter 12, in the court of Pharaoh, in the court of Abimelech, rather, you know what? Grace helped him to get through it. And even when he also stumbled in the manner of the manner of Hagar and Ishmael, grace also helped him when through that situation. Men and brethren, even the channel through which the Lord was giving Moses, as we have told you, was a product of grace. It was by grace that he was preserved. It was by grace that Elohim ordered his steps to become a son of Pharaoh, so called through his daughter, the daughter of Pharaoh. And all that Pharaoh did, all that Moses rather did, was really grace in action. Why? Moses sought the way of Elohim. He sought to see the glory of Elohim. He wasn't looking for miracles, signs, and wonders. He knew Elohim. He knew who he called him. And so we are told in Psalm 103, verse 7, he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. So Moses functioned in grace, and grace enabled him. And one and brethren, what is it that preserved Israel through the wilderness they went through? It was grace. They were stiff-necked people. Israel, <laughs> I don't think Elohim has seen a people who are so tough to lead as them. Yet, even though they couldn't keep the law, Elohim's grace preserved them, preserved them through their iniquities. Elohim still loves them up to today. And what is it about that we need to take note of? It is that Elohim had desired 
that those who receive this grace will learn how to trust in him, how to trust in him and not trust in themselves. When we learn how to trust in him, it makes all the difference because the biggest problem Elohim has with people is when they don't know how to trust him, but they know how to trust their own ability. Men and brethren, the reason why we want to share these things is for us to understand that in the fullness of time, it pleased Elohim to bring forth the fullness of grace in the world in the person of Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua was not an afterthought after Adam and Eve fell. Yeshua was the plan. If you read Revelation 13 verse 8, what is called the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, the reality that the son was going to through a sacrifice he would make in due course of time reconcile mankind to the father. In other words, Yahweh created Adam and Eve knowing fully well in his omniscience, in his omnipresence that Adam and Eve would miss it and the provision was made for Yeshua. And that is why it's important for us to understand about Yeshua. Part of this lesson and the next one has to do with understanding Yeshua and what he came for. Because we are told in the book of Luke chapter 1 verse 30, that 30 to 35, about how the angel Gabriel announced to Mary the extraordinary miracle, what you can call in vitro fertilization, whereby Holy Spirit who came and planted Yeshua in the womb of Mary so that divinity will become humanity, so that grace will proceed. What was the same principle in Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time was come, Elohim sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. To receive the adoption of sons, the Father had to make it possible. That is why, men and brethren, it is so important for us to know that Elohim graciously revealed himself to mankind in Yeshua. And those who tried to grapple with it yesterday were trying to speak to a young man, and it was so difficult because he was a super soul. He had this great analytical mind. He just couldn't grab anything. He couldn't grasp anything. And thank the Lord. The people there helped me to tell him the things of the Lord are not apprehended by the natural mind. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says from verse 14. That the natural man received not the things of the spirit of Elohim. Why? For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually designed. Elohim was expressed in Yeshua because it was his plan that grace will come fully, bodily into the earth rim and the price will be paid for all to come back to the Father. That's those who receive the invitation of grace. John 1 says in verse 16 and 17, of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace. It was all about grace. For the Lord was given by Moses, that grace and truth came by Yeshua. So Yeshua, therefore, came as a catalyst of grace so that all our sins, our iniquities, if we have faith in what he came to do, by confessing and forsaking the sins and repenting of them, we are taking them and casting them upon him on the cross so that in exchange, we can get the righteousness of the Father which is in him. You know what? John chapter 1, verse 29 says, The next day John seeth Yeshua come unto him, said unto him, Behold, he said, Behold, the Lamb of Elohim, which taketh away the sins of the world. The same principle in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he had made him to be seen for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Elohim in him. In other words, the, place, the cross is a place of exchange. I come with my sin by faith, cast it upon Yeshua, and then I draw down the righteousness of the Father in him by grace. And we need to understand this, that that plan of Elohim is to simply create new creations on the earth realm, citizens of the kingdom. That's what we're told in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Yeshua, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
So Yeshua came from heaven to earth not to set up a new religion. Religion was set up in Rome. Uh, you know, we came back from Italy a few days ago and we're sharing with them the what happened in the land of Italy, in the city of Milan, when the Edict of Toleration was signed by Emperor Lysinus and Emperor Constantine in AD 311 AD. 311 AD, from that day that edict was signed, Christians lost the cutting edge of the gospel, which was persecution, trials, martyrdom. It made them to be on fire on the go. But by the edict of toleration, the Roman Empire said, now we no longer persecute you. We recognize you as a religion. Go about your thing publicly. From that time, spiritual obesity came. From that time, edema came. And it was only a matter of time. By the year AD 381, the Roman emperor of that time, called Emperor Theodosius, had officially brought a marriage between the Roman Empire and the church. And they too married in Kahoot, and Yeshua was taken out of the picture. Christian religion emerged. Between the time Yeshua gave the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 24, verse 14, till these 300 years later, they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They were proclaiming it. And the gospel of the kingdom was not the same as Christian religion. Christian religion is about getting people into a building, getting people to, to, to come and meet a man called a priest. And the man in turn will meet Elohim. And the people were clients in late late. When people in Bible colleges and across the world don't seem to realize that what we see today are mutations of an error, a fundamental error that happened in the fourth century. So the Father wants to lead us into the original plan as in the Holy Scriptures, and he said, don't allow the vestiges of Christian religion to define your thinking. We can't put new wine of kingdom truth in old wine skin of Christian religion. It won't work. It will bust. And so the Lord is challenging us to come off that busting wine Yeshua didn't come to set up a new religion. If you read the book of Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 9 to 15 very well, Yeshua came to bring many sons to glory. Sons of Elohim like himself. In other words, the ultimate son, Yeshua, was given as a sacrifice by the Godhead so that through his death at the cross, those who would believe, as many as will believe, no matter the number, they can become sons of Elohim in the earth realm. They relate to their father, and their father is everywhere all the time, so they don't turn off and, in, and on when they are in the church building and out of the church building. Men and brethren, the hidden mystery of the new creation, therefore, is to repopulate the earth realm with sons of Elohim. Are you a son? Congratulations. That's what grace does to you. If you release yourself to the work of grace, otherwise you could just be mere, engaged in mere religion. Mere religion, religious activities, rituals with our heart, and it can be self-deceptive. And that's why we urge you to stay with us. We're going to be looking at this course very systematically because if you can understand grace, if you can walk in grace, then you will understand the mystery of being a son of Elohim, either in a male body or in a female body. That's why we don't emphasize so much, you know, gender in the church of Yeshua as a male and female, because the male or the men are simply sons of Elohim in male bodies, and the women are simply sons of Elohim in female bodies, because everything is in the spirit man, which is neither male nor female. That's where you receive salvation. That's where you receive Holy Spirit. That's where the gifts and callings of Elohim are in the spirit man, which is neither male nor female. And it's from there that the gifts and callings flow. It's there that that's where it's called the belly. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Brothers and sisters, we come to the end of lesson six and the assignment for you today is please share three solid takeaways for you from this lesson. What did you understand? Tell us three things you understood in your own language. Don't just go and leave things we put in the lesson. What did you understand from what has been shared? Remember, this is a train-the-trainer program. It's deliberately designed that anyone who goes through it has the capacity to teach other people. That's why it's intensive. 
It's intentionally intensive. So by the time you finish going through it, the stretching will come to a time where there is a snapping and your spirit man is snaps away from the bondage of the body and of the soul, which is called the flesh. When your spirit man snaps away from their stifling control, your spirit man is able to soar to the throne of grace and to interact with grace, which is the helper of the kingdom of Elohim. And you can sit in heavenly places with Yeshua, and he sits in you by his spirit, which becomes a mobile temple of the Holy Spirit. And when this is so, you can literally be an expression of grace anywhere you are. May the Father help us in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now let's go on to lesson number seven. Lesson seven, Yeshua, Jesus, grace and the kingdom of Elohim. Men and brethren, here we want to emphasize the reality that the Father, it has pleased him that all the grace he has been working with people from the beginning of time, he will, in the last days, bring it together into the person of Yeshua, who is incarnation of Elohim. So in the fullness of time, grace in his fullness was revealed in the person of the God-man, Yeshua. The mystery of Elohim becoming a man in order to fulfill the legal basis of redeeming man is a subject that confounds even the most brilliant of human minds. Professors can't get it because it's not something you get. Job said in Job 3.25, can you by such and find Elohim? The answer, of course, is no. You try to logicalize it. It's illogical. It's totally illogical. Elohim becoming a man. The incarnation is illogical. And so please, when you see people who are not able to receive it, don't be impatient, don't be angry, don't be offended. Just know it that they are simply showing us the limitations of the human mind. First Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of Elohim. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? <clears throat> Sorry. Where is the disputer of this world? Just a minute. Where is the disputer of this world? Thank you. Had not Elohim made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of Elohim, the world by wisdom knew not Elohim. It pleased Elohim by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. But we preach Yeshua crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks' foolishness. This sounds foolish to the philosophical Greeks. And it's a stumbling block to the Jews who are wrapped up in the veil of Moses. You know, but we preach Yeshua crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Yeshua, the power of Elohim, <clears throat> the wisdom of Elohim. Why? Because the excuse me, <clears throat> because the foolishness of Elohim is wiser than men, and the weakness of Elohim is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many noble are called, but Elohim had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And Elohim has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. Had Elohim chosen yea and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. No flesh should glory in his presence. That's such a privilege for you and I to be called. For you to know that Yeshua is Elohim made flesh. It's not flesh and blood that reveal it to you. It's election, and election is election of grace. It is the Father at work to make you to embrace him. And where he has brought you, you know where you were a year ago. You know where you were five years ago. You know where you were ten years ago. And looking behind, look at the great things the Father has done in your life. And if he's not done, then I can tell you he's done in my life. I see grace. Grace is never ending. I see grace. Grace identifying more grounds, higher grounds, deeper depths. Grace identifying things the Father wants to walk in us. And men and brethren, the truth is that only the humble 
we have the deep things of Elohim revealed to them by Holy Spirit. Why? Holy Spirit bypasses the intellect to deliver divine truth. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of Elohim in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which Elohim ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew for. Had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. When they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. If they had known it, they wouldn't have made that demand. Satan didn't know it either. Satan didn't know it either. Through that act of crucifying him, that Yeshua will pay the price for humanity to be restored. But as it is written, verse 9, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which Elohim have prepared for them that love him. But Elohim has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of Elohim. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man that is in him? Even so, the things of Elohim no man knoweth, but the spirit of Elohim. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of Elohim, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by Elohim, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but a natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of Elohim, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually designed. The he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet himself is judge of no man. Now what we're saying is that the Father wants to tell us some of the things about the embodiment of grace that is in Yeshua. The embodiment of grace in him you can never comprehend with a natural mindset, with a logical mindset. The simplicity of faith is called for. That's why he said we should repent and be like the two children so that we can enter into the kingdom and to function as his complete man. Yeshua had to shed part of his glory. During the 33 and a half years, he lived in the air train. I told him Philippians 2 from verse 5, Let this man be you, which was also in Yeshua, who being in the form of Elohim, taught it not robbery to be equal with Elohim. Did not clutch at his being Elohim, being part of the Godhead. He didn't clutch at it. What did he do? But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of a man, of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, Elohim had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Yeshua is Lord to the glory of Elohim the Father. And so, this is why it's important for us to know all that the Father is telling us about Yeshua. You think it's common knowledge? No. Why do you think a lot of people have not received him? It's because they can't receive that Elohim became man. It's an impossible proposition to people. Religious people are thick. They can know about Jesus as Lord, but they can't understand the dynamics because religion can block the mind. Or even if they understand it, they can't know the deeper mysteries thereof. For instance, we are told in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1, Elohim who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, had in this last day spoken to us by the Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the walls, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. It's so important for us to know that Yeshua's incarnation is the ultimate expression of the grace of Elohim. And so while he walked on earth, Yeshua modeled the way the redeemed are to live. He himself, in the form of a human. He received grace for the assignment and he grew in grace. This is so important. Look at what Luke chapter 2 40, 40 says. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of Elohim was upon him. And then we are told in John 1 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
And of course, verse 16 and 17 says, And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace, by the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Yeshua. And then, grace, he grew in grace. He himself received grace to function. And then, he was endued with fullness of grace when the Holy Spirit came upon him at the baptism of John. You know the story? That Yeshua for 30 years, he lived like an ordinary person. No record of any great thing he did, except when he went to the temple at the age of 12. He went with Mary and Joseph to the temple. Other than that, he was a mere carpenter like Joseph. He was an apprentice, of course, to Joseph, because children are apprenticed by their parents. He learned carpentry. He was an ordinary na person, an ordinary Nazarite. No big deal, no miracle, no crowd. Then on his 30th year, he went for the baptism of John. I told him John 1.29, the next day John see Yeshua coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of Elohim, which take away the sin of the world. This is he of whom it was said, After me cometh a man which is preferred above me, and was before me, and I knew him not. But he that, that he should be banished first to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. John Bericor saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remain on him, the same is he which baptized with Holy Ghost. And I saw a bear record that this is the son of Elohim. I want you to, I want to explain this passage. John is a relative. John the Baptist is a relative of Yeshua, was a relative of Yeshua through his mother Elizabeth. But listen to this. John was told by Elohim that one day I'm going to unveil the Messiah to Israel through you. One day you see a man coming. I'll give you a revelation. And even as I give you the revelation that he will be the Lamb of Elohim, in case you will have doubts, in case you didn't know it, when he is being baptized, the Spirit will come upon him bodily. And that will be a grace without measure releasing to him. And I will speak from heaven, and you can know for certainty, and you will tell people. And so he was reporting that that's what happened, what Elohim told him concerning the Messiah that will come. And so as John was to bear record in John 3, 34, he said of Yeshua, for who in whom Elohim has sent, speaketh the words of Elohim. For Elohim giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. So, when Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove, it's simply an expression that he came upon him bodily. In other words, fully. No half measure, no quarter measure, full measure. And all that Yeshua was to do, the miracles, everything he was to do, anywhere, all that he was to do, how he was able to do signs and wonders, raise the dead, how he was to heal the sick, everything he did, the bread he broke and distributed to people and it was multiplied. Everything was because of the anointing of grace releasing to him when the Holy Spirit came upon him bodily. That's what Acts 10, 38 means when he says, how Elohim anointed Yeshua of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? For Elohim was with him. So in other words, Yeshua himself needed grace to function. That grace was dispensed to him by Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. And I want to ask you, if the very son of Elohim, if Elohim was manifested in the flesh, needed grace to function in those days, how much more you and I how much more do we need grace of function? We need grace for family business. Life in the family. We need grace for ministry. And even ministry, you need grace for your own peculiar ministry. If you're an apostle, you need grace for that office. You need a prophet, you need grace for that office. You're an evangelist, you need grace for that office. You're a pastor, you need grace for that office. You're a teacher, you need grace for that office. You're a deacon, you need grace. You're a deaconess, you need grace. You're a minister, you need grace. You're in the worship team, you need grace. Your grace varies. Let me tell you this, brethren. Let's say you're in the worship team, and 
other people are in ministry, you go to events, they bring out things, you know, oily food, fried food, everybody's enjoying the taste, and they're like, oh, this is great, this is wonderful. For the sake of the voice with which you do the worship and praise, you don't partake of the oily, fried oil. So also you get a place, okay, you are thirsty, you want to drink, people, they bring chilled water, chilled drink, oh, that's just gulp it and drink. But for you, who is called to praise and worship, you need to protect that voice. You don't need that cold water. You might take cool water, but you don't need the cold water because it may not be good for your voice. So men and brethren, grace enables us to know what we can do by his grace and what we should avoid by his grace. Grace enables us to know how we can function optimally. Grace enables us to know our lane. Grace enables us to run our race. Grace enables us also to enable other people, including those who will sin against us, including those who are going to scheme against us, those who are going to throw thoughts against us, those who are going to try to throw a wrench in the, in the wheel, where you are tempted to excise judgment against them, remember, grace was released to you. You are alive because of grace. Grace, how much grace have you received since we were born again? Since we were born again, how many times have you sinned against the Father and His grace restored you? And the Father is saying, that's the same way He wants us to restore people who do things we don't like, who offend us. And it's not just that, oh, no, no. We do it from the heart, from the heart. He wants us to imitate Yeshua HaMashiach. Men and brethren, the kingdom is a gracious kingdom. It's a kingdom of grace. If we deploy grace in the kingdom, the difference will be very clear. The only problem is that somehow the old nature takes on when we're offended, when somebody does something we don't like, the offense, we, if we are not careful, you can give room for the offense to dwell in the heart, dwell in the mind. It becomes a stronghold. It becomes difficult to deal with. And even today, the Father says, no matter how strong you are feeling, that thing you are clutching onto, look away from the person who offended you. Look to yourself so that you don't lose what you wrought. Look to yourself and look to the cross. Look to him who forgave you, who has been forgiving you and is still forgiving you and let go. Take a plunge into the pool of the blood. Take a deep dive and say, Lord, I missed it. It's not even my brother or sister who said or did anything to me. It's me who is holding on to it. If we are radical that way, let me tell you, we're going to overcome every situation. In these last days, one of the things Satan knows he can do. There are people he knows he can never be able to turn them into immorality. He can never turn them into lying, into cheating, into fraud. But one of the things he does easily is to allow people to step on our toes and allows us to latch onto it, allows the offense to be cultured and cultured and cultured until fellowship is broken. Men and brethren, you know what? If Yeshua needed grace to function in the air dream, how much more we, how much more we, who were born in sin, shepherd in sin, in iniquity where our parents, did our parents conceive us? How much more do we need to? And that's why the Bible says we should look up to Yeshua in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and because there was joy set before him, the joy of the glory the Father will restore to him when he finishes with the cross, the joy of seeing you and I, it doesn't matter where our locations are. He saw me. Even when I was in Port Harcourt, Nigeria, where I was born, he saw you. You know, there in Illinois, there in Connecticut, there in Texas, there in Florida, there in Tennessee, he saw you. He saw me. And for the joy that through his death, you and I can be reconciled. He embraced the cross. He received grace to embrace the cross. Can we receive grace to forgive, to let go? Can we receive grace to be imitators of Yeshua HaMashiach? Can we receive grace to become different from the world around us? The world is on the broad way of hating and being hated. Can we receive grace to walk in the, 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 the narrow way of love? Absolute love. Love not for those who, who have done us good, but those who are putting their finger in the pie to destroy the pie. Grace is available. Men and brethren, there's one other reason why the Lord gave us this lesson. It is this. 
a new generation of so-called kingdom believers has been spawned in the earth to him over the past 70 years. From different locations, people who are children of Arius, the priest of Alexandria, Egypt. Arius was the man in the 4th century who said that Yeshua is not divine. He's just a messenger sent by the Father. He's not Elohim made flesh. So in this modern day era, they have coalesced into what is called the pseudo kingdom movement. If you dig into their teaching, it is this. Yeshua is not divine. He's like a prime minister appointed by, by God to, to come and do something on earth. And you know what they are doing in, in there is Yeshua is not the king of kings the way the Bible paints him. Their theology is about a, a king. That king is you, yourself. And indirectly, without telling people what they are doing, they have eaten the heart of people. Even in IMF, we saw people begin to use some pseudo-kingdom phrases. When you dig into it, you know the root. A man rose from the Caribbean basin, teaching people like Jeroboam to neglect, to deny the divinity of Yeshua. Men and brethren, Yeshua is the king of the kingdom. He is the center and circumference of the kingdom. So who ever told you to preach the kingdom, don't preach Yeshua, is a liar. Yeshua is, the kingdom is all about him. He is the spring and source of the kingdom. And he is the model man for us to imitate. And the Father wants us to know that you can't mess up with the identity of Yeshua and say you are in the kingdom. No, it's not possible. It's not true. And so today, I want you to have this assignment. Please cite five scriptures which affirm the divinity of Yeshua that minister to you in this lesson. And number two, what give us two things you receive from this lesson that is your takeaway. The Father loves us dearly and wants us to remain in His grace and to be people who give Him right of way to guide us, to lead us, to strengthen us, and to make sure that all that He has called us to be and to do, we attend to them and we do not miss them because He loves us. He wants to encourage us. He wants to empower us. Brothers and sisters, let's live the life of grace. Let's not give room for our flesh. Let's not give room for all the things that can, you know, basically take us outside of the kingdom. Grace is the key to live the kingdom life. Grace is the key to remain in the kingdom. We love you dearly. I will pray right now and I will make a birthday announcement. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your grace release in this lesson today. We know you are up to something. You are laying a foundation for the things you will teach us to break down this truth. And you wanted us today to cast our mind onto Yeshua Hamashiach, who is the author and finisher of our faith, whom you have graciously given to us among humans so that we can through him be saved and we can through the grace in him live the kingdom life, overcome all challenges and succeed. Thank you for what you are saying to us in the now. We embrace you with joy. We say, have your way and be glorified. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, we have a, a few bad days today, but one of them is our brother, Apostle Joshua Mbakara, who is in Paris, England, uh, Paris, France. Uh, Apostle Joshua is the one who the Father is uh, tapping to lead IMF France. We've had people, but they've not been able to really, truly get on with the uh, uh, garden of the saints together. And so, Apostle Joshua, uh, happy birthday to him. And our sister Valerie Pillay in South Africa, and our sister Sadora David, Davis in the U.S., may the Father bless you all. I will say to you all, listen, I received uh, information that the IMF USA conference, the date for you to be able to book has been extended even to the end of the month. So you can book your hotel at the same rate. Those wonderful, extraordinary rates that have been advertised is so awesome to think about what the Father has done in giving us rates that are so beautiful. Can you imagine? If you want to be alone from Friday to Sunday, it's just 230 
you know, yeah, sorry, if it's just two hundred. If you want to share with two people, uh, with one person, two twenty, two thirty dollars, you pay two thirty. The person pay two thirty. You use a big double bedroom and you have all the meals from Friday evening all through Saturday and Sunday morning. Isn't that awesome? And is in Connecticut, USA. Uh, you know, so marry them. Double points by four points by Sheraton. So please contact Apostle Junior Paracha or uh, Miss Rose Tuka or P Pastor uh, Janda Shepard or Teacher Stephanie. Any of them that is your friend on Facebook, send them an inbox. And if you want to come from abroad, they will give you a letter of invitation if it's not too late for you to get your visa. And the date is 19 to 21 of July. And the youth summit will be a day before, Thursday 18th and Friday morning. The young people will gather. Even if you are not in the USA, you're a young person, you want to be in an atmosphere where the Father's grace will be poured out. Then, you know, contact Pastor uh, Brother Samuel J. Fumer, who is Director of Youth and Next Generation, or Pastor uh, Prophet Jeremiah Shepard, or any of the people who are in the, even the organizing committee, so that they can give you more information. And men and brethren, the Father wants us to prepare the great encounter. And remember, the master class graduation, that is 2018 master class, will be 12 noon on Friday 19th. And IMF UK, their conference will be a week earlier, 12th and 13th, at 821 Old Kent Road Road. And Pastor Grace tonight cannot wait to meet you. If you are in the UK, you are in Europe, you can fly in there. Let's all have a great meeting. You know, across the Atlantic. It's so interesting. London on this side of the Atlantic, Connecticut on the other side of the Atlantic. In a week gap, it's awesome. I believe the Father is up to something. I told those in the U.S., listen to me. This is the last normal time. The last conference in normal times. Because certain things are, going, are being activated in the realm of the Spirit. And we are going to see those things begin to emerge seriously. It's so unfortunate that the major prophets of the day have allowed their eyes to be blinded by politics, partisan politics, that is to say. And they cannot see far off. And brothers and sisters, the end of the age is coming closer and closer. And the Father wants everyone be careful how you walk. Be careful who you work with. Make sure you work with people who remind you of the times we are in and you remind them. Exhort one another. Encourage one another. Occupy. Take hold of grace and use grace to expand everything in you. We don't know what's ahead. The date, but we know the time and now is the time. Thank you so much, Elect, for being on the camera with us today. Bye-bye for now.